today I'm going to talk about uh, what are the key aspects to consider when you are approaching a valve in valve tower. So first of all, you have to understand the cause of failure of your prosthetic valves. Um, basically, you have to exclude uh, the presence of uh, um, endocarditis or a thrombus formation on the valve. Uh, in order, because these two conditions obviously cannot be treated with valve in valve tower. In presence of uh, uh, valve thrombosis, uh, um, anticoagulation has been demonstrated to be effective, and uh, usually you perform one or two months of full anticoagulation and then reperform a CT scan in order to see if the uh, thrombosis has been solved or not. And second, you have to exclude a pre-existing patient prosthesis mismatch. This occurs especially in small valve sizes. And in this regard, it's important to check the first echo after surgery and to follow up the evolution of the um, aortic gradients across time uh, in order to understand if the echo was uh, since the beginning very high and further deteriorated or or if there is a full deterioration of the valve across the time. And it's also important to calculate the projected indexed EOA. The ratio between EOA and the body surface area of the patient uh, can help to diagnose a severe patient prosthesis mismatch. Uh, a severe patient prosthesis mismatch is present if this ratio is below 0 0.65. Why is this important? because uh, severe patient prosthesis mismatch at baseline has a significant impact on mortality after valve in valve tower. And this was demonstrated in the valve in valve registry by PBARO, which is a very large registry on valve in valve patient and severe PPM was independent predictor of mortality during follow-up. Additionally, um, these authors found that also using a self-expanding device in patients with pre-existing severe PPM helped to improve the hemodynamics of this patient after valve in valve tower. Next, you have to estimate the risk of coronary obstruction, which is very important in this kind of procedure. So uh, delayed coronary obstruction has been identified as a clearly associated to valve in valve procedure. And in valve in valve procedure, coronary obstruction can occur acutely right after valve implantation or can occur also several days after intervention. And uh, in this regard, as a um, logic, self-expanding device um, have been uh, shown to um, be associated with a higher risk of coronary obstruction as compared to balloon expandable devices, mainly because self-expanding device, when this study was performed with Evolute, this was a supraannular valve, so it's uh, uh, more risky in terms of coronary obstruction. Uh, how to avoid coronary obstruction? First, you have to identify uh, the surgical valve you are treating, and uh, you have to understand whether the aortic leaflets are above or below the sewing ring. And this is particular importance because in uh, uh, prosthetic valves with a supraannular design, the aortic leaflets will be higher. So when you are going to implant a tablet device inside it, the aortic leaflets will be completely averted. And if they hide, they can reach the coronary ostia. They can get close to the coronary ostia thus leading to coronary obstruction. And also it's important to know the device to uh, tailor the implantation because you have to know what you're going to see during intervention. There are valves where only the sewing ring is visible, others where you, the sewing ring is not visible but you can see the stent frames and other ones where there is no mark. And this is important because you have to know what is the lowest part of the prosthesis during implantation in order to target your implantation depth. Among uh, uh, several valve types uh, which are commercially available uh, in this study by Dvir, uh, they demonstrated that uh, uh, those stented valves with externally mounted leaflets 
and the stentless valves are those with the highest risk of coronary obstruction. And next, uh, you have to uh, merge the information of the surgical valve with the anatomy of your patient. And therefore, you have to study very carefully CT scan. You have to classify your patient in these three categories. And you have to understand whether the aortic leaflets extend above or below the coronary ostia. And if they extend above, if they extend above the sinotubular junction as well, or if they stay below. So in this condition, type one, you will never have a risk of coronary occlusion because the aortic valve leaflets cannot reach the coronary ostia because are below. In type two, where you have low coronary arteries, you have to consider the distance between the coronary ostia and the prosthetic valve because if you have a phased sinusis, a very short distance like in panel 2B, you can still have a risk of coronary obstruction. And of course, in type three, when you have your aortic leaflets, which extend above also to the sinotubular junction, you do, not have, you do not only have to calculate the distance between coronary ostia and the prosthesis, but also between the sinotubular junction and the prosthesis. Because for example, in panel C, you may have a good distance between the coronary ostia and the leaflets, but a small sinotubular junction. So, when I implant a tab in this scenario, may occur sinus jailing leading to coronary occlusion. So how do we practically calculate the risk of coronary obstruction? Basically, you have to simulate the implantation of the TAVI device inside the bioprosthesis. You have to track the perimeter of the TAVI device you are going to implant and be concentric to the um, internal circle, which is the uh, surgical valve. And then you have to measure the distance between the uh, TAVI device and the coronary ostia. If the distance is below four millimeters, this carries a higher risk of coronary obstruction and you, uh, you should uh, um, act accordingly. And additionally, it's also important to study the orientation of the surgical valve because in presence of um, the prosthetic valve being not coaxial to the aortic root, you may result having a, a smaller distance to the coronary ostia. So this may be a more dangerous situation compared to a coaxial prosthesis versus aortic root. So in presence of a high risk of coronary oxygen, what can we do? Basically, we have two techniques. First, the chimney technique, which is based on uh, placing two stents in the coronary ostia, right coronary artery and left main, and deploy the stents after tower or the basilica. This is the experience we had at our center with the chimney technique. In our database in this uh, period, we are enrolled about 56 patients treated with portico valve in valve tower. And among these 56 patients, uh, uh, chimney technique was required in a large proportion of them, 41%. What were the characteristics of these chimney technique patients? They were a higher prevalence of female gender. Uh, there were small valves and there was a high prevalence of the sorin microphone, which is among the most dangerous valves uh, in terms of coronary obstruction. The most important finding of our study was that device success was comparable between chimney and non-chimney technique patients, and we did not experience serious complication uh, in this subgroup of patients. So what's the next step to consider? Minimize the risk of high post-procedural gradient. So uh, if the risk of coronary obstruction is the, among the most important risk involving our tower, the risk of post-procedural gradient, which can be uh, high, it's the second most important problem to deal with. And in this regard, uh, there are papers in the literature that demonstrated that a high implant can result in a larger EOA. And as you can see here in the left panel, if you implant uh, your TAVI device too deep in the left ventricle, the uh, new TAVI leaflets will be not uh, uh, able to fully expand and this will result in a smaller EOA, whether 
if you manage to implant the TAVI device high, uh, the TAVI leaflets can expand fully, and this will result in lower gradients. And also in this study published on aerial intervention, you can see in this uh, evolute uh, uh, patients uh, treated with valve in valve, if you manage to have an implantation depth not higher than five millimeters, this is associated with low post-procedural gradient, whereas this was not the case for implantations deeper than five, six millimeters in the left ventricle. And again, on multivariate analysis, a high implantation, as well as the use of a supraannular device was associated with favorable post-operative gradients compared to uh, balloon expanding device. And here I will uh, present to you how do we perform implantation at our institution. So this is an example of a microflow, uh, 21 millimeters. So with this device, you can see the sewing ring marker, which is the lowest portion of the valve. So first you have to start from a tilt cusp coplanar view and then adjust your projection in order to keep the sewing ring aligned. And uh, mm, then we start with the implantation, the first, this is a portico, uh, with the full, uh, the first phase of release, uh, all in this projection. And then uh, before completing the release, you have to check that all uh, inflow edges are below the sewing ring deprostasis. This is a, a sort of a, a sign of safety. And, uh, if we have uh, doubts, we also check in another projection, which was in this case, the parallax view. In this view, you can see that uh, you have all the stent struts aligned. And as you can see, there is at least one stent strut, which is near ground zero to the uh, sewing ring. So we were not confident with this implantation when we um, decided to uh, recapture the valve and try uh, a bit of deeper implantation. This is the second try. Again, you can see here that uh, uh, two stent struts are a bit deeper into the left ventricle. And we also check again in the parallax view. Now you can clearly see that all the stent struts are clearly below the sewing ring of the microflow. So we were okay with this uh, result and we proceeded to uh, the second part of the cortical deployment. You can appreciate here in the left the deployment and this is the final result. You can see how um, implantation depth uh, is uh, asymmetric because we have some stent struts uh, two, three millimeters below the sewing ring and other struts which are maximum half cell below, which is about six, seven millimeters. So overall, this was an acceptable implantation depth for us. And uh, another tip you can use during this uh, kind of intervention is the rapid pacing. Rapid pacing can be very useful because by decreasing the stroke volume of this patient, it helps to increase the stability during valve deployment. And if you're using portico, another suggestion is always to wait at least uh, two minutes before going to the final phase of release in order to let the nitinol frame work and to improve the anchoring of this uh, TAVI device to the sewing ring. However, even though you're trying always to optimize as much as possible your implantation depth, uh, you can still have to deal with, with a, a proportion of patients which will maintain high post-operative gradients. And this is taken from our single center experience. And in these valve uh, uh, valve patients, uh, the persistence of a high residual gradient was the main cause of device failure. Uh, at our institution. So, uh, and of course, uh, uh, high residual gradient was observed most frequently in patients which had a stenotic degeneration or a mixed degeneration of uh, the bioprosthetic valve. So what to do in these cases where you have, despite a good implant, high residual gradient, uh, the option is the valve cracking. This technique was first performed in 2015 um, on a mitral flow, and uh, there were main bench testing in 2017. And uh, uh, what is known is that you have to use a balloon with a size greater 
than the surgical bud label size. Of, um, the balloon has to be non-compliant in order to uh, distribute the strength and the force in, uh, homogeneously across the entire balloon and uh, also a high pressure balloon. And it has been shown that uh, this technique is safe because uh, the external fabric covering on the surgical valve is not disrupted by the valve recracking. In this table, uh, you can appreciate how not every um, bioprosthetic valves can be fractured. So you have to be aware of which valves cannot and can be fractured. And also cracking occurs at different pressure. In this regard, it's mandatory for every interventional cardiologist who is approaching to valvin valve tower to have this up, valvin valve aortic, because this is a large library containing all available uh, types of uh, bioprosthetic valve. And for each valve, you have information of what uh, TAVI device you should choose and also if can be cracked or not, and also the size of the true balloon. These are some data involving the um, valve cracking. And uh, in these 20 consecutive patients, you can see that valve cracking was performed on a large variety of bioprosthetic valves, and uh, especially in small label size valves. In all cases, uh, valve cracking did not translate into intraprocedural complication and led to improved hemodynamics in all patients. In this other study, uh, the authors tried to investigate whether valve cracking should be performed before or after TAVI device, a TAVI release. And the authors found that uh, um, putting the TAVI device before valve ring cracking is better in terms of hemodynamics because especially for sapient tree and accurate NEO, there was a larger improvement in the post-operative gradients if the valve ring cracking was performed after uh, TAVI release. How do we practically perform valve ring cracking? So first we have to select a non-compliant true balloon with a diameter at least one, one millimeter greater than the label size of the bioprosthesis. For example, if you want to crack a 19 microflow, you have to choose a 20 millimeter true balloon. Then you have to connect the uh, balloon with, through a high pressure y valve to both a syringe and an in deflator. And then you start with the rapid pacing and turn the stopcock to close the line of the in deflator and start inflating the non compliant balloon through the syringe. Then at maximal inflation, always under rapid pacing, you rapidly turn the, top cock, the stopcock to close the syringe line and you fart and inflate the true balloon using the in deflator, trying to go up with atmospheres. And then how do you diagnose valve ring cracking? Valve ring cracking you can um, notice either by uh, the occurrence of a small fracture in the valve ring under fluoroscopy or by a sudden pressure drop of the in deflator. This is an indirect sign of successful valve ring. And now I would like to share with you this case example of this patient, which summarized what uh, I have uh, explained so far. This is a case of a male with a degenerated, uh, degenerated stenotic mitroflow 19. As you can see on the CT scan, we have very low coronary arteries, both RCA and the left main. So what we do is we simulate the implantation of a portico 23 in this patient. And in, in this figure, you can appreciate the inner circle, which is the uh, perimeter of the mitral flow 19. And the outer circle is the um, perimeter of a portico 23 millimeter. It's important when you do this simulation to be concentric. So, so the two circles must share the same center. And then you have to measure the distance between the outer circle, which is the portico 23, and the coronary ostia. And you can see that um, the distance is both under the cutoff of four millimeters. So this is a case with high risk of coronary occlusion. And here you have the procedure. This is the basal angio. Again, 
this three cusp co planar view with the adjustment in order to align the sewing ring. Then, before crossing the valve with the portico, we intubated the both left main and RCA and placed two stents in the proximal tract of the coronary arteries. And then, this is the uh, we proceed with the valve release. And uh, you can see here in the right panel how the portico 23 is uh, uh, severely underexpanded. So in this case, we decided to perform valve cracking. This is the hemodynamic before cracking, so more than 20 millimeters of mercury. We used a non-compliant through 20 balloon at uh, 18 atmospheres, and we were able to uh, successfully crack the sewing ring of the mitral flow. And the post-operative uh, um, gradient was significantly improved compared to that of pre-cracking. Next, uh, after fully post-dilating the valve, we proceed to the deployment of the two stents. So what we do is to pull uh, both stents uh, partially in the aorta and uh, about one third of the stent in the aorta, two thirds in the coronary artery, and we inflate uh, both uh, stents. Uh, when doing this, you have to be um, try to be as much high as possible in order to um, overcome the aortic uh, leaflets of the Tyvee device so that the neocoronary ostia will be higher, so with the less risk of coronary occlusion. And this is the final result. You can see how the implantation depth is uh, uh, optimal and also the coronary flow is uh, uh, maintained uh, through the um, chimney technique. And also we had no uh, PVL. So in conclusion, the procedural success of a valve in Baltava depends on careful planning. Uh, you have to know exactly what is the surgical device. You have to study the CT scan in order to estimate the risk of coronary obstruction based on the aortic root anatomy of your patient. And in all cases, coronary obstruction must be predicted and can be avoided either by chimney or basilica technique. Uh, when dealing with uh, valve impartave, you have to be aware that the persistence of post-operative high gradient is the main cause of valvin Bartavi failure. And um, for this reason, when you're implanting a TAVI device, you have to try to be um, as much high as possible and have a high implantation. In order to uh, perform the deployment, you have to align yourself with the sewing ring, or if the sewing ring is not visible, you have to align yourself to the uh, lowest part of the device. And uh, after completing the first phase of the deployment, you have to check that all the stand struts are below the SUNY ring in order to avoid pop-up. And uh, if you are in doubt, uh, take your time and also check in another projection if uh, uh, you're safe enough uh, to go. And uh, rapid pacing, uh, in our experience, uh, has been very useful in this kind of procedure to increase the stability of valve deployment. And if, uh, despite all of these, you have still high post-operative gradient, consider the use of valve ring fracture, because this technique has been shown to improve in all patients the uh, valve hemodynamic. So thank you very much.